I'm Audrey Foster with Nebraska Extension in Custer County, and I'm their summer employee. Today is our second day of exploring natural dyes, and today we're going to be working with hot bath dyes, or instead of yesterday where we used the sun to help our dyes react, today we're going to be using heat from our stoves. So it's a little bit different of a technique, but it will sure be fun as well. Today, we're gonna to be working with dandelions and nettles, both two pretty common weeds here in Nebraska, at least in my family. And we're gonna be dyeing, or at least I worked with dyeing 100% wool yarn. You can also try this with other types of natural fibers, such as linen, cotton, or silk. I just like the idea of dyeing yarn. And then I can go ahead and knit something out of the products. Okay. So before we begin, there's a few basics we should get out of the way, such as safety. We're going to be working with all sorts of hot materials, such as the hot water, so make sure that you get a parent's help when you're working with your stoves. Also, this can get a little messy, so make sure that you're wearing appropriate clothing, such as full long sleeves and pants when you're collecting nettles, or just making sure you have old clothes on so that you don't accidentally dye your nice clothes. Another thing to keep in mind with safety is the different types of pans you use. I like to use stainless steel because they don't react with the dyes and different chemicals we use. You want to make sure that whatever you're using is safe. Also, all the different natural dyes we'll be working with today are non-toxic in the quantities we're using. However, not all natural dyes are non-toxic, so make sure you do your research before working with each of them. Also, research is just important in general, and there's various sources that I think are good to look into. Uh, Dharma Trading Company has a lot of good resources for dyeing in general, but especially for natural dyes. There's also a couple books that I've enjoyed reading while I've researched this whole natural dyeing process. Wild Color and A Garden to Die For. By no means are these the only two books. These are just the two that I liked. Also, Keep in mind that you need to be harvesting your different plant materials responsibly. Our nettles and dandelions here in Nebraska are pretty much considered weeds, but there's all sorts of other cool natural dye methods you can use, such as blackberries or marigolds. You wanna make sure that if you're harvesting these, you're doing so responsibly and not just taking them from a neighbor, but asking permission. Also, keep in mind that you should only take one third of the plant matter if you're wanting to keep the plant. Nettles and dandelions, this doesn't as much apply unless you're wanting to grow dandelions and nettles, but this could matter if you're trying to collect blackberry leaves or rhubarb leaves. So it's just something to be aware of. The time of year that you harvest your plant materials also makes a difference, such as spring versus fall can result in different colors. Also, the different parts of the plants can make a difference as well such as the dandelions we'll be working with today. A lot of natural dyeing is just experimentation, being creative and trying new things. So keep a journal as you work, so then you can keep track of what you tried, so then you can build off of it for future experiments and trials. I know that I sure had fun, and I'm happy that I recorded what I did so that I can refer back to it in the future. This video is not an exhaustive resource. There's so much out there, and there's your own creativity and minds as well. So I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with and just have fun with this process and try new things. Because after all, you can't learn new things unless you try. I'm excited to go through this process with you. So to start our dandelion dye, you have to go out and collect a whole bunch of different dandelions. You can collect the leaves or the heads or what I'm gonna do is both. And you no, know, depending on what you choose, you'll end up with different colors. But I want kind of a yellowy green. So I'm gonna go for both leaves and um, the heads of the dandelions. And you can go wherever you can find a whole bunch. For us, it just happens to be our yard and around the farm. So yeah, happy picking. So for this type of dyeing, I'm going to be using wool yarn. And as you can see right now, it's pretty loose. And if I was just to stick this in the pot, it could get tangled up pretty quickly. So we're going to take some steps to make sure that it doesn't just end up a tangled mess. Also, the type of uh, wool that I'm using is 100% superwash merino wool, which means that it's a protein fiber, which means that it comes from our environment. So it'll absorb dye very, very well. So what we're gonna do to make, to keep this from getting to be a tangled up mess when we dye it. So I found my end, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut off a chunk of yarn so that I can secure my 
um, the rest of my yardage safely. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut this in half so I can use half of it for this skein of yarn and half of it for the other because I'm going to be dyeing two skeins of yarn today. So I'm going to cut this in half and then I'm going to cut each of these into four. There we go. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of them and I'm going to wrap it around in one spot. I'm going to go ahead and tie it. I don't want to tie it too tightly, but because I want to allow dye to penetrate all areas of the yarn and I don't necessarily want to get a tie dye effect, such as if I was to um, tie it really tight, that could possibly happen. So I have one there. So I'm going to go to the opposite end. And you'll want to repeat this for however many skeins of yarn that you have. The first step in processing the fibers is to clean them of all the different dirt and grime and chemicals that were placed on them to help finish the fibers. So what I'm going to be doing is adding a teaspoon of Synthrapol, which is a textile detergent, to my water. Then, after this has been mixed in kind of well, I'm going to add my fibers and let them soak in it for about an hour. Next, I'm going to take all of my fibers that have been tied up and I'm going to place them into the water. This water is at room temperature right now because I want there to be a gradual change in temperature for my fibers so that they don't get matted. So I'm just gently pressing them into the water. Then I'll turn on my stove and heat the water until it's between 140 and 160 degrees Fahrenheit. At this point, I will turn off the oven and I will just let it naturally cool down for one hour. So now that it's reached between the temperature of 140 and 160, I've removed it from heat and I'm going to let it just cool down for one hour. Now that my fibers have been cooling down for an hour, it's time to add them to the mordant pot. First, I'm just checking temperatures to make sure that they're roughly the same temperature so that I don't cause fiber shock and which will make the fibers matte. After I've checked temperature, I'm going to go ahead and add the mordants to the larger pot. The mordants I'm going to be using are alum and cream of tartar. The quantities for these depend on the amount of fiber you use. Make sure you weigh your fiber before you get it wet at the beginning of this project. For every pound of fiber that you use, you're going to use 1.7 pound or 1.75 teaspoons of cream of tartar and one teaspoon of alum. After you've added your mordants to the pot, you can go ahead and transfer your fibers. Then you can dump your cleaning pot outside or wash it down the drain with lots of water. While your mordants are simmering, you can go ahead and start your dye bath. Here I have put my dandelions on the stove to boil for 30 minutes to an hour. These are allowed to boil, however you do not want your mordants and fibers to boil. So now that everything has been either boiling or simmering for an hour, we're gonna go ahead and take out all of the plant material and you can throw it out. And then we're gonna be moving our yarn from our mordant water into our dye bath. Make sure that the two are a very similar temperature before you transfer the yarn or your fiber so that you don't accidentally cause fiber shock. So now I've gone ahead and separated my plant material from my dye, and so I'm gonna move my yarn to my dye bath. So I just put my yarn into my dye bath like five seconds ago, and you can see that it's already starting to change colors. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this simmer for 30 minutes to an hour. I'll check on it after 30, but I'll probably let it go the full hour, and I'll just let it get to the color I want it to.
Now my fibers have been cooking for one hour, so I've gone ahead and taken them out of the dye and put them in another bath of Centropol and water. I just used one teaspoon for mm, about a gallon of water. And so I'm just gonna let this soak in here for a little bit and then I'm gonna let it line dry. Now that my yarn is all dried, I'm gonna hang it up on the clothesline for a few hours or until it's dry. So to start off today, I'm going to be collecting some nettles, and as you can tell from my attire, I am very much covered because we're going to be collecting nettles, and as they're stinging, you want to make sure that you have long sleeves, jeans, and gloves so that you can avoid as much stinging as possible. I mean, these stings are not poisonous. In the past, people have actually made tea and eat nettles, so they're not poisonous. They're just kind of uncomfortable uncomfortable. So I have my tools to collect. I have a plastic bag and a pair of scissors and my gloves. So I'm going to go ahead and collect a bunch of nettles just down here in the ditch and down by the creek. If you guys need help locating nettles, let me know. I have more than plenty to share. So enjoy your harvesting. <laughs> So as you're harvesting, just make sure you get the nettle tops. You don't necessarily need all the roots and everything, just the tops. Now that I've got a big bag of nettles collected, I have my large pot ready to go and I'm going to just chop up my nettles into small pieces and put them into the pot. However, I'm still going to use gloves to do this, but I'm not going to be wearing my heavy duty gloves. I'm going to switch to lighter ones that you might use for like food prep and stuff. So now I've got my nettles all chopped up in my pan and I filled it pretty full. I'm not sure exactly how many nettles I need. I just guessed I chopped, chopped up the whole grocery sack worth. And now I'm gonna let them steep for 24 hours in boiling water. So I've gone ahead and boiled one batch of water and I'm just gonna go ahead and pour it on top. I'll probably need a few batches of water just because it's a lot of leaves. So there's one. Just like with the dandelion dyeing, I've already gone ahead and tied up my yarn. I'm now gonna submerge it in a pot of water with Synthropol for, just like we did with the dandelions, for one hour. Now that my temperature has reached between 140 and 160, I'm gonna go ahead and shut off my stove and let the fabric just sit in there for one hour as it cools down. So at this point, my <clears throat> fibers have. So at this point, my fibers have been cooling in the soapy water for about one hour. So what I'm gonna do now is check the temperature of my pot and check it of my mordant pot and make sure that they're about the same temperatures because we don't want to fiber shock our wool fibers. If we were to do this, the fibers would mat and they wouldn't be near as pleasant to work with. Okay, so first off, I'm gonna check these temperatures. This one's at about 124. My other pot's at about 114, so they're very close, which is good. Okay, now I have to transfer my fibers from my soap and cleaning pot into my other pot. This is a good time to note that the kind of pot you use does matter because different metals will react with the dyes and the chemicals we're using differently. So I'm using stainless steel pots, which is a really good idea. So for instance, I mean, you wouldn't want to be using an iron pot or a copper pot or something that would react unless that was the type of effect you were going for. But it's just one of those things to be conscious of. I just happen to like stainless steel because it's a little bit more controlled. Okay. So now that we have our fiber all clean and it's free of all the greases and the different finishes that were given to the fibers to give it a good appearance, we are going to put it in our mordant pot. The mordant just kind of helps it to take the color more readily and to stay color fast. What does color fast mean? It means that it holds on to the color longer so that it doesn't fade as quickly. However, sometimes that can be the look you're going for it, so that can also have its advantage. But for this instance, I want mine to be color fast. So I'm gonna use mordants. The mordants I'm using are just like with the nettles, or just like with the dandelions, are gonna be the same for the nettles. It is going to be alum and cream of tartar. So depending on how much uh, textile material you're dyeing, 
Keep in mind that you need to weigh your textile materials before you get them wet so that you get like true weight of them. Um, you're gonna want to use, um, for every one pound of textile material, such as yarn or fabric, you're gonna want to use 1.75 teaspoons of alum and one teaspoon of cream of tartar. That's for every one pound of materials. Today I'm working with half a pound of yarn, so that means that I used half a teaspoon of cream of tartar and a little less than a teaspoon of alum. So you'll, you guys will get to do your conversions there and have a parent help if you need help with that. Okay, so I've already dumped my cream of tartar and alum into my mordant pot. Both of these are non-toxic when used in these quantities, but as you're working with chemicals, you still want to be kind of careful. And now I'm going to be transferring my fibers from my cleaning pot to my mordant pot. So I'm just going to lift them up out of here and I don't want to wring them because that will stretch and break the fibers. So I'm just going to gently squeeze out some of the liquid. This can be kind of hot, so if you need a parent's help, ask them. Okay, and then I'm going to put it into the other pot and it gets to soak in here for another hour. Um, it's gonna be simmering in this pot, so we wanna get it up to simmering temperature and then turn on the timer for an hour. However, while we're waiting on this one to simmer, we can also begin working with our nettles too. Remember that <laughs> now it's been a little over 36 hours, but you want your nettles to be steeping in water for about 24 hours at least. Mine has been 36 because of the way my days broke down, so now I can go ahead and start heating them. So I'm going to remove this pot. This soapy water can be dumped outside, or if outside isn't a good option because you live in an apartment or something, you can always dump it down the sink with lots and lots of running water. In the meantime, my nettles have been steeping and they're starting to get a little foamy. And now what we're going to do with our nettles is we're going to let them simmer for 30 to 45 minutes. So where this needs to simmer for about an hour, we may wait to start our nettles for a little bit. Here is what our nettles currently are looking like. Nice and fresh looking. And then over here we have our yarn. At this point, everything's simmered or boiled as long as it's needed to. So I'm gonna go ahead and strain all the plant material off of my nettle dye bath. Once it's been strained off, then I can pull my um, yarn out of my mordant pot and transfer it into my pot that has my nettle dye into it. At this point, I think I have most of my plant matter taken out of my dye pot. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is move my yarn from my mordant into my dye pot. So I've just moved my yarn from my mordant pot to my dye pot and I'm gonna let it soak in here for about one hour. I can go ahead and dump my extra mordin outside or down the drain with lots and lots of running water, and I can go ahead and dump my plant materials out as well. My fiber has been boiling for an hour, so I've gone ahead and pulled it out and put it into a pot with centerpol and water just so that it can clean. So I've gone ahead and pulled my yarn out of the water, I've rinsed it, and now I've hung it up on the line to dry. Um, I like the initial light green color, however I'm a little apprehensive about this type of yarn where it's so thin and so tightly wound. When I look at the very, very inside of it, it did not dye near as well as the outside. And so, I don't know, this makes me like the other yarn weight a lot better, but I mean, this still, it took the color nicely, so we'll see what the end result brings. Now that you've finished dyeing your natural fibers, do they look like mine? Probably not. The natural world is so cool and unpredictable and, well, unpredictable, so results are always gonna differ. For instance, my dandelions, yours may be more yellow or more green, depending on what quantity of, or er, ratio of leaves to blooms that you got. Also, your nettles may look a little different as well. I think that I wanna try my nettles again with a different kind of fiber and a different yarn to then see if my results change. 
But the great thing about natural dyes is you can always keep trying and learning new things, and I encourage you guys to do so. There's so much cool stuff out there and so many more colors to dye than just yellow green is, I've dyed a lot of it, it seems like these past few days. There's all sorts of other reds, or reds and purples, and I hear black beans turn out pretty cool as well, and they end up in being kind of a blue hue. So I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with, and most of all, just have fun and enjoy the process.